I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we analyse the suspected Ukrainian drone attack on Moscow, dive into issues around Ukraine's food security, and Joe Barnes reports on a military funeral he attended in Kyiv. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 30th of May, one year and 95 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I am joined by our Russia correspondent Natalia Vasilyeva, our Brussels correspondent who's on the ground in Kharkiv, Joe Barnes, and foreign correspondent Colin Freeman. I started by asking Natalia about the news from Moscow. Not only inside Russia, but on Moscow, which would make it the first major drone attack on the Russian capital. Hi, everyone. Yes, indeed. This morning, we saw footage and video from western suburbs of, suburbs of Moscow, from the southwest of Moscow, showing minor da- damage, showing drones striking three buildings inside Moscow, air defense system destroying several of them, several drones approaching Moscow, and uh, basically drone debris uh, scattered around the area. That's such a rare attack. It's the first time it happened since the war started. It obviously took Russians by surprise. There was quite a telling comment from a former top general who's now a member of parliament who said something to the effect that Russia is a large country and it's not easy to intercept all drones and threats and there will always be loopholes. So what, what we know about the target so far, it appears that there was at least... I mean, I personally counted 13 confirmed um, strikes or 13 confirmed drones which were shot shot down or crashed into something inside and outside of Moscow. Media reports varied from 20 to 30 30 drones. Uh, It looks like there was a wave of drone attacks that started somewhere on Moscow's western outskirts. Again, this is where the drones would be going if they were traveling from Ukraine. We know that several drones crashed in Rublovka, most prestigious neighborhood where Vladimir Putin lives, where basically most of his cabinet lives. This is the place where um, Russia's richest men have their summer houses and all-year mansions. And um, at least one of those... um, at least one of those uh, drones crashed in a prestigious uh, cottage community where Putin's billionaire friend Arkady Rosenberg lives. We also heard a report of a drone crash in the community where the chief executive of Gazprom lives. And it looks like drones that were not intercepted on the, um, in, in, in Moscow suburbs went on to the southwest, southwest of the city, where they crashed into three high-rise buildings, including one on um, Leninsky Avenue, which is a neighborhood I happen to know really well. It's quite an upper-middle-class neighborhood, really green and nice and uh, prestigious. And one block of flats that was hit this morning, I mean, we're not talking about any significant damage. We're definitely not talking about the victims, but I guess that's the idea that 15 months into this war, residents of the Russian capitals are that vulnerable. That's quite striking. And again, I just looked up for my own interest the block that was hit hit by a drone this morning in Moscow. And if you want it, you could buy a two-bedroom apartment there for the pretty price of £600,000. So it's not Russia's border areas that were hit. I mean, places like Belgorod have have seen drone attacks for months. It's the first time when suspected Ukrainian drones appear to have penetrated that deep into the Russian heartland, essentially getting as close as they can to the seat of power. Obviously, we saw the attack on Red Square on, on the Kremlin on the 9th of May. But this one apparently was, this one is quite embarrassing for Russia because they were, as we can see, from 13 to 20 to even 30 drones. And a lot of them were apparently allowed to travel as far as the southwest of the city. 
Thanks, Natalia. Do we have a sense yet? I mean, I know I know it's early days, but what's the reaction been on the sort of the Telegram groups that we've we've heard a lot about these these sort of so called milli bloggers who who write about what they think of, about the elite's conduct of the war, and and also if you've seen anything, have you seen how like state media has been reporting this? Yeah, uh, it's actually two two very interesting and different stories. First of all, with state media, it was quite interesting to watch it because in the morning, when I guess no one quite knew what was happening, or maybe when state media were not giving extensive an extensive briefing by the Kremlin, the drone attacks were quite heavily featured on morning on morning TV shows on the nine and ten o'clock news. It was the first item, and as the morning progressed by early afternoon. On some state media, there's a very brief mention of the attack. On um, other state media, the the story is completely absent. And I guess the idea is that, when, like as we've been seeing, the Kremlin is trying to play it down. We've just had the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov come out and basically say, nothing to see here, moving on. It was a minor attack. No one was hurt. No one was seriously hurt. There was no damage. And that's that stands in quite a contrast to what we've been hearing from Russian nationalist bloggers. And uh, some of them have been openly gloating over the attack because to them, it's, uh, you know, when they were looking at the pictures of Moscovites panicking at the size of the drone, to them it was their sudden the moment when they saw that the war has finally affected those upper middle class Moscovites who wouldn't give a fig about it. And there's one quite popular military blogger who specifically mentioned that it's probably the first time in the 15 months of war that Moscovites can forget about the smoothies and scooters and actually face the reality of a war. I don't know if we can describe him as a blogger, although he's been very active um, in the public domain, but Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, had uh, another outburst this morning when he issued quite a lengthy and angry statement, sparing no swear words directed at the defense ministry, accusing them of being, quote, morons and letting the drones get into Moscow and basically call, calling for action and calling for blood. Thank you very much, Natalia. Joe Barnes, can I go to you next before we come to Colin? Joe, this attack on Moscow comes after days and days of relentless drone and missile strikes on Ukraine. What's it like being there? What have you seen? Hi, folks. And what I will say to start with is um, Ukraine have obviously, as they always do, denied any responsibility for these attacks or kind of turned a blind eye to this one attack in Moscow. But they have at times, like officials have, I think it was um, Budinov, who's the head of military intelligence, has suggested that there would be retaliation for these strikes that we've seen in Kiev and other cities in the last few days. So potentially is that sort of, is this... Russian drone a strike in Russia a message from Kiev to show look we we can stretch our abilities to hit you do stretch to Moscow so that gives like essentially creates like this psychological barrier for any time that Moscow does something it knows that something could come back in that direction but that's obviously just speculation kind of opinion on my part but yeah no let's let's really dive into what's been happening since the early hours of Sunday morning Kiev has been on the receiving end of an unprecedented barrage of Russian-launched drones and missiles to give you a breakdown on the strikes. On Sunday afternoon, Ukraine's general staff announced it has shot down 58, 59 Iranian kamikaze drones. They're the Shahid drones that we hear so much about. More than 40 of those were downed over the capital in Kiev, according to local authorities. So I was able to witness two waves of these attacks. So they got sent in about 20 drones each. And when I say actually witnessed, I was asleep in my hotel room, the sirens blared. And it kind of, it woke me up from my snooze at about sort of 3 a.m. And then about sort of 10, 20, maybe half an hour later, as I was tossing and turning in my bed, there was this loud explosion, huge explosion. It was enough to sort of shake the windows of my hotel. And it was a, it's a very sturdy hotel room. I wasn't in a high sort of I was like fifth floor or something like that so it really wasn't like up high but this drone must have been quite close and I guess that just it's easy for me to say that but this is like happening to Ukrainian sort of daily for the last three days Re- the residential buildings have been hit by debris of these things coming down so it's it's actually it's a it's nothing more than sort of a, a an attempt to strike terror into the into Ukrainians having to live this so but on Sunday afternoon, I I drove to 
Harkiv, so I've not been able to witness sort of the full length, full, fuller sort of extent of these attacks unleashed by Moscow. So similar happened in the early hours of Monday morning, where more drones were fired uh, at Kiev in the early hours. I think the real chaos and sort of the main thrust of what I'll speak about is what happened during the daytime hours. It was at a time when children were walking to school or people, the streets were busy with people just going about their everyday lives. And that's when Russia started firing missiles at Kiev. Um, and it's, I, I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but these Russian strikes have been isolated to the very early hours of the morning. So when people are inside, because there's, there's a curfew basically from midnight to I think five in the morning, unless you're a sort of a, have a valid reason to be outside, you're not meant to be outside. And the, the, the strikes are basically being restricted to those hours for the last months. But so this is the real first strike inside the heart of Kiev, Kiev when people are out and about and doing things that it was busy. And there was this really striking, it's probably the most prominent social media video that I've seen. And it was a group of students walking through the Poddle district. It's a trendy neighbourhood known for its kind of cool bars and cafes. Uh, me and Natalia were speaking about a sort of a South Korean, Korean style restaurant that I should visit when I'm next in town there the other day. That's to kind of give you a sort of a feeling for the place. But there, there was this like kind of loud explosion and these kids are like running for cover. And yeah, it's just, it's just quite shocking to see, really. And so I think in total, the numbers announced on Monday were 37 cruise missiles and 35 drones fired at Ukraine, mostly at Kyiv. The majority of them were intercepted by air defences. And so President Zelensky has praised the Patriot system and praised uh, air defence units in general in the last few days. But that, what that doesn't stop is debris from these missiles and drones falling from the sky and landing in residential buildings. On Monday, Monday's strikes, one landed on a petrol station, uh, which caused a mass fire. Oh, sorry, one on Sunday night, one caused a mass fire that broke out at a petrol station. It killed one person. There was another incredible footy, bit of footage from Monday, this is, and that showed the remains of a missile landing basically right in front of a car as it moved as it moved forwards, so that's the kind of um, thing we're dealing with. And the air raid sirens have been basically near constant in the last few days. That's in Kiev, but also in other parts. I'm in Kharkiv at the moment, and that has uh, really been um, sort of a prominent thing of Ukrainian daily Ukrainian life is is now the air raid siren, and it has been, it normally is, but it's probably to a greater extent uh, in the last few days. So then again, more strikes. So basically on Tuesday morning, to early hours, and it. It was uh, 30 drones launched at Ukraine, 29 of them were intercepted. Again, more pictures of sort of destruction, buildings on fire. And then you speak to people in Ukraine and you're going, why Why is this happening? Why, why, why now? One reason people come up with it is an act of desperation from Russia. They have nothing else to do. They've got nothing to offer on the front line. There's no chance they could launch another um, offensive at any point soon. So it's just, it's just desperation, sheer desperation. Is it trying to wear down Ukrainian air defences? Potentially, yes. Then there's other people that would say it's potentially an entirely emotional response to the upcoming Ukrainian counteroffensive. President Zelensky yesterday set out his plans and he didn't say what they were, but he said, look, the date, the time and the plans are confirmed. That's all you need to know. Has it potentially been that... The Russians have got hold of these dates from whatever sources their intelligence is still it might not as be as good in as it was in the past, but actually they've still got a, a fair grip over what's happening in Kiev. And is that why? So they has the counteroffensive due to be start soon had to be maybe it was due to be starting soon. And is that Russia basically reacting emotionally, as some people have put it, to that? Um because these, these attacks really have no strategic, no tactical impact on the battlefields in the south and east of Ukraine. So yeah, what what are they trying to get out of it? We don't really know. There's lots of speculation to be done. The thing we could say about the drones are probably actually far more dangerous now than um, Russian missiles and sort of these cruise and ballistic missiles. Because the fact that the Patriot systems and NASAM systems, all of these kind of great Western systems have been donated and dotted around Kiev in various locations, has made it a a, a relatively safe place like fatalities have been largely low and it has taken sort of 
over what so it's like probably nearly 150 kind of munitions thrown at Kiev for for a hand for not even not even five deaths. That's and it's obviously tragic as each one of them are. That's a a really poor return if you're a Russian general asking for sort of a, a cost analysis on what you're doing. But the drones are more dangerous because they they're relatively low price. They're harder to pick up because their radar sort of profile is lower and they often make it into the city but the the ukrainians have had relative success good success using the german jeopard anti-air guns for instance so you see a lot of videos and there's a picture of a what looked like a jeopard on the banks of the Dnipro shooting one of these drones down last night the one the other thing that sort of and we reported it in a piece on the drone strikes on uh, sunday morning was that there seems to be a growing confidence in Ukraine that Kyiv is so well protected that they officials don't mind this volume of attacks hitting the capital because essentially Russia is expending and throwing needlessly pointlessly tens of millions maybe hundreds of millions worth of technology high precision missiles and the like at Kyiv only for them to be blown out the sky without them having any sort of remote effect on the battlefield at all and actually in Kyiv obviously people are worried there's pictures of people like huddled up in metro stations and shelters but largely people don't let this sort of get them down spirits are high morale's morale's good so it's not Russia is not having a great effect on the kind of the population there and Russia doesn't have the capacity to build these weapons on mass anymore. There's sort of rumours that it can produce 40 a ver- forty kind of long-range precision munitions a month. That's of varying capabilities. I won't go into what they are. But yeah, there's it's essentially a, a pointless attack that's basically sowing terror across the capital. It's waking people up in the middle of the night, forcing them to seek shelter. It's targeting people as they're going about their everyday lives. They're in restaurants, bars, cafes, just at work or whatever you want to... Whatever kind of people do during the day that's but it's not what it's not doing is it's not furthering russia's sort of military goals in trying to seize more of the donbass after kind of back moots fall and stuff like that so but i'll stop there and that's that's what we can say there thank you very much joe barnes and natalia vasilieva colin freeman can i come to you thank you so much for giving up your time and, and joining us you've written a fantastically interesting piece on uh, the telegraph website if you want to read it The headline is like swimming against the current in sulfuric acid, the battle to supply Ukraine with food. So you're looking at food supply um, in the country. Why did you decide to look at this and what did you find out? Well, yes, the uh, this the, the the quote likening the supermarket supply chains to swimming in sulfuric acid was a rather colourful quote given to me by a Ukrainian supermarket boss, Mr. Dimitro. Sigankov, I hope I've pronounced his name correctly. He's the boss of a chain of supermarkets in Ukraine called Silpro, which is about sort of seven or eight hundred of them. Quite upmarket, perhaps the equivalent in the UK might be um, Waitrose or something like that. And um, we decided to interview him because one of our rather sharp-eyed feature editors on the features section of the paper was struck by the fact that um, while we've been hit in Britain quite a bit recently by food shortages, we've been uh, had a run of shortages of eggs recently, also uh, roast chicken and various vegetables. The, these are things that have been b- blamed variously on Brexit and poor seasonal weather and uh, high inflation and also knock-on effects of the war in Ukraine. Um, that, that's been, there's been some supply problems in Britain. Uh, meanwhile, in Ukraine, the way you really would expect the shelves to perhaps be half empty or completely empty and the supermarkets maybe to be largely shut, things are generally okay. And um, so the feature editor asked me to take a look into why this was. And um, the, hence us doing this interview with the boss of the Silpo um, supermarket chain. But this was something I had, I had noticed ever since I first arrived in Kiev, right at the, at the beginning of the war or, or on about day five, when I was warned that the food supply chains in Kiev would, pretty much, would, would be pretty soon collapsing and that I was uh, advised to, that I would be best if I was traveling in from Western Ukraine to Kiev to take my own f- supplies of food with me. Um, and th- th- this seemed like pretty reasonable advice at the time because normally in any war zone, the, f- the, the supermarket shelves are often a casualty, firstly of panic buying 
And then secondly, of collapses in the logistics chain. They're often one of the, among the first places to be shut. Sometimes they get looted. And of course, as roads get bombed and bridges get destroyed and all these other things that we've seen happen in spades in Ukraine, it's very easy to imagine a complex supermarket supply chain collapsing altogether. So when I first arrived in Kiev, I, out of curiosity more than anything else, I went to a local supermarket just to see even if it was still open. And I went in and it was basically like being in Sainsbury's or Waitrose or Tesco's anywhere in North London or any other well-supplied metropolis in, in Western Europe at that time. There was nothing I couldn't have bought there that I could not have bought back home, save for fresh bread and fresh deli produce, where there was a temporary blip that was rectified a few days later. Um, I remember being pretty astonished at that, partly also because, like many people, I had figured that Ukraine's supermarkets were perhaps still suffering from a bit of a Soviet, a post-Soviet hangover, and that uh, that they wouldn't have that much stuff in them in the first place, and they certainly wouldn't be up to the standard of the supermarkets that I was used to in the West. But that, that was very much not the case. And the, perhaps the real surprise, though, has been how they've managed to keep them going ever since then. And the, according to uh, Mr. Sigankov, this has been mainly just a, a triumph of logistics at both macro and micro level, partly due to the goodwill of the staff. Mr. Sigankov said that uh, he, he was in Irpin, the, the Kiev suburb. He decided when the war started that the best thing he could do was to just keep the supermarket chain running as, uh, as well as he could. He went down to his local store with his wife and they, they just carried on business, really. And, and that has been, I think, the motto ever since. Clearly, a lot of their workers have left to uh, as a supermarket workers for supermarkets all over Ukraine, and quite a lot of their other workers have gone to the front to fight. But then among those who've remained, I think there was a feeling that to keep in supermarkets going is a is a valid contribution to the war effort. So that I don't think they've had enormous staffing problems of the sort you might expect. And then in, in terms, of course, of the logistics situation, when the war first started, you had Russia blockading the main port at Odessa, which is where Ukraine imports most of its foodstuffs and, of course, exports a great deal as well. So they had to find a way around that basically meant bringing food in overland from Europe instead. Regular listeners will, of course, know that there's a grain deal now that allows Ukraine, a, a UN brokered deal that allows Ukraine to ship grain out of Odessa port, but it does not permit, as far as I understand it, that deal does not permit the Ukraine to import foods. Therefore, all the regular food imports have to be brought in across Europe, which is a, a formidable kind of rewiring of the, the supermarket logistic chain. They've also generally shifted from um, truck, transporting the majority of goods by truck, as I understand it, to transporting them by train, because of the train network, for various reasons, has, has been continued to work largely intact in um uh, in Ukraine, and then um, other things. In order to sort of to plug the inevitable shortfalls in supplies here and there, Mr. Sigankov has, has done what every supermarket these days is attempting to do, certainly in Britain, which is to buy local. So he went to something like 500 local suppliers in and around Kiev. Um, often, I think, little sort of small mom and pop corner shop bakeries, that sort of thing, and said, can you keep our shelves full of cookies and bread and sausage and things like that? And drew up, drew up lots of very short term little contracts with these people. None of the complicated stuff that you might normally get if you're um, sourcing stuff in the West. Very short term contracts. And um, that through that uh, system, managed to keep the shelves full. And uh, I think, as I understand it, I think quite a lot of these producers and suppliers they will be continuing to use once the war uh, is over. Some of them obviously perhaps not maybe 100% organic or have vegan and vegetarian options and gluten-free and all the usual fripperies that we've come to expect of our modern consumer society in, in the supermarkets. But generally speaking, that, that's been one of the pluses of it is that it's, it's this, this crisis has meant that supermarkets have started to supply a lot more local, but 
purchase, sorry, a lot more local food in Ukraine. And one way, though, that, yes, so far, certainly if you went to a supermarket in Ukraine at the moment, I think outside of the conflict areas and even right on the, the in, in the towns very close to the front lines where there's hardly anybody living, I've certainly been in quite a few supermarkets than them where you, if there wasn't a war going on, you'd probably struggle to notice that there was anything short on the shelves, except that is the booze, because in many parts of the country where there's um, that they're considered an active combat zone, there is a booze ban, which um, I have to say is one thing that I don't entirely approve of um, when I'm travelling around there, but uh, that's purely a personal view. Thank you very much, Colin. I mean, as you say, it's such an important part of the story, and we haven't really spoken about it that much, so I would recommend listeners to go and read Colin's piece. Just one more quick question from me, Colin. At the end of your piece, um, there's a rather tragic note when you talk about, well, are there any essentials Ukrainians are still sort, uh, are still short of? And one thing they mention is salt. Could you tell us just a little bit about that? Why is there a lack of salt? Yes, well, uh, apparently a lot of the salt used to come from the salt mines in the city, in and around the city of Bakhmut, which used to supply 95% of Ukraine with its salt. Bakhmut, of course, as many listeners to the podcast will know, is currently the focus of the main battle between Russian and Ukrainian forces in the Donbass. And as I understand it, the salt mines were actually claimed by the Russian forces, by the Wagner Group forces some months ago. So that's stopped Ukraine getting its regular supplies of salt, although apparently they're now getting salt from Western Ukraine instead. And uh, it's not that difficult, really, to source alternative supplies for for the majority of the the goods um, in your average supermarket. Colin Freeman, thank you so much for joining it. We really, really appreciate it. And it's great to hear you again. Thank you so much. Joe Barnes, can I come back to you? You've written a really, I mean, an incredibly tragic dispatch from Kiev, a, a funeral of, of a soldier. Can you tell us about this story and what you saw? Yeah, well, and I'll just kind of go back to Colin quickly, um, saying that you wouldn't know there's a war going on in most cities I, I've travelled through. Like, I'm in Kharkiv at the moment, and it's one of the cities that was really battered, and it's it's still not back to its former glory yet. But the supermarkets were full, um, Shelves were packed and busy in coffee shops and life is returning. That's one of the, the things and people aren't deterred by what's going on. But yeah, now now to the story of Igor Mia, Mia, Mia Mayasak. He was a volunteer combat medic and he died, now, which we now know, um, after he took... They were on a, a medical evacuation mission on the outskirts of Bakhmut and his team took a wrong turning... And they ended up being sort of caught in this Russian artillery barrage as they were trying to reach their fallen brothers in arms. In the initial fog of war, Igor, who was 29 when he sadly passed away, nobody knew if he was alive, dead, being captured by the Russians for two months. And so during that two months, his friends, his family, his wife, his mother were all praying that he'd been captured by the Russians. But what it turned out, their worst fears were realised. And when these units from... The Azov group came uh, and took some of the flank back on the northern side of Bakhmut. They tragically found his body there, and so he was confirmed dead, and he was brought back to Kiev, where he was. his funeral took place. Um, and I think what's important from this is actually, obviously, the death of a soldier is tragic. There's been lots of funerals, and it's always, it's always like, I've... I've attended a, a number of military funerals and or passed by them they're, they're really tragic affairs it's it's men dressed in their fatigues and that that kind of pixelated camouflage the ukrainian armed forces has become renowned for but instead of donning their kind of ak-47 rifles their kalashnikov rifles they've swapped those out for a, a bunch of flowers and it's it's and it's it's grown men who are one day fighting on the front line returning to cry over the coffin of a friend it's, it's it is in incredibly tragic but I think what this death highlights is Ukraine's need for combat medics as defence kind of swaps out to a fence soon. Um, really, Ukraine's army is desperate for combat medics. People have been saying that look, that's what they're desperately in need for. They can't say requests and try attempts to train combat medics can't be answered quick enough. And basically, is there enough kind of combat medics in the pipeline to sustain Ukraine going on a major offensive to retake land from Russia. We we don't know. But 
there are sort of there are groups out there and I will touch on that later as one of the stories we're working on there are groups training combat medics but are they able to train combat medics quick enough fast enough to basically fulfill Ukraine's needs but uh, back to Igor so Igor was a really touching story for many and kind of tragic story for many reasons he was firstly he was a volunteer he volunteered at a young age during the Donbass war in 2014 um between Ukraine and the little green men of kind of Putin's kind of proxy war in Ukraine during that time where he's a combat medic he is a published author he's a novelist and a poet so his call sign is the poet um which has been embodied his image but he was offered a job as a military press officer when he first signed up and he said no 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 I want to make an impact not having a pop at the many talented military press officers that we all work with while we're out here and at home but he said no I want to make a difference I want to save lives so he became and trained as a combat medic he later left the military because his uh, father was ill so he came back to live with his mother and his father and basically look after his father but when um Russia invaded he again signed up and said look I can make a difference and he did he went about serving as a combat medic again and i think what happened was and it's this, again this is it's incre- it shows the bravery of ukrainians he was he was posted in a unit which wasn't doing kind of frontline duties and he told his friends and it was shortly after he had had his first novel published last autumn that no look i'm going to leave this unit and I'm going to sign up for a unit that is actively fighting in Bakhmut. So he, while most people would cower at the idea of going to Bakhmut, he is going, no, I'm going to go because I want to make a difference. I want to serve on the front line. But then a bit about Igor in general. So he used to, instead of sending a customary WhatsApp message with a hello, he would often send new acquaintances a, a poem. And, um, after the, the funeral ceremony, it was an orthodox ceremony like so many in Ukraine. And it was so it was it was days before his 30th birthday as well, when he was cremated and laid to rest. But I, I got speaking to a guy called Serhi, who was Igor's main trainer and mentor when he became a combat medic and they served together over many years. And he um he said, Oh, let me read you a, a poem that Igor had written to his wife about having a son and that was his dream but only after the war against Russia had been won because he essentially feared about the the prospect of his future offspring having to pick up a rifle to defend Ukraine like like he's had to had to put their life in danger to do that and I'll, I'll recite a bit of the poem now it's uh, you are my half of my heart you are sorry let me start again you are my half of the heart though the battle is fierce now I will return when the war is over this is when we win it. Wait for me, my love. I ask only one thing. Are we back when the peace comes, when we have won it? And that one thing is he wants a son. But um, yeah, and you just, I think the thing about military funerals is they are so, they're happening so frequently, like estimations of potentially 20,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed in action since Russia invaded was it 16 months ago nearly probably it's over 16 but i don't know but they all tell their own story and there is never one funeral that is the same they're, they're often widely attended they are not just a soldier they are someone's husband they're someone's son they're someone's daughter someone's wife for instance um in this case we bumped into another sir he so he kutcher who was a um who grew up playing football with Igor and they played on the same football team and Igor actually convinced Serhi to volunteer in February last year for the armed forces to fight for his his country and he 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 of basically describing Igor said look he didn't feel comfortable in Kiev he wanted to serve on the front lines where he could help the most and that that just goes to show like how selfless some Ukrainian servicemen or the majority of Ukrainian servicemen are they're not ones to cower and go I don't want to go to the front line they they want to help they're they're fighting for their country it's 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 an incredible feat of bravery in each and every one of them and I think the sort of hilarious story that his wife Marina told us um, which kind of strikes this guy as a 
as a just a, a regular guy and they're saying oh he was scared of his mum so scared of his mum that when he first met his wife he would only pose for photos in a balaclava not because he was scared of sort of the little green men these enemy enemies that had invaded Donetsk and Luhansk it was because he hadn't told his mum he'd volunteered to join the army and had not told her that he um, had stepped foot outside of Kiev and he'd Essentially, told her he still had a job in Kiev, so he only wore a uh, balaclava to protect because he was not afraid of his enemies, but because he was afraid of his mother. And I think that's just quite a tragic story. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much, Joe. As you said, a very tragic, tragic story. But thank you very much for your reporting. Before we finish, Natalia Vasileva, can I come back to you? Last week we had you on to talk a little bit about the Turkish elections. Well, we we have a winner. Could you tell us a little bit about what's happened in Turkey and if you've detected anything that that uh, relates this to the to the ongoing war in Ukraine? What might the uh, re-election of Erdogan mean for Ukraine? <laughs> Sure. We do have a winner. It's the same man who's been ruling Turkey for over 20 years now. As uh, if you look at Turkey's role in the um, in the war in Ukraine and on the European continent in general, you can see that Turkey has got himself itself in a complex web of relations with Ukraine, with NATO, with the West, with Vladimir Putin. In his campaign, Erdogan has been eager to offer to his voters something to set off the astonishing run, astonishing hyperinflation that Turkey has seen, that is a a, a major cost of living crisis. So, for example, one of the things he's been offering is a... um, uh, he famously offered Turks one month of free gas for household supplies. And gas prices in uh, this country have been kept quite low by, uh, I would say, European and global standards. And one of the reasons is because he managed to convince Vladimir Putin to offer a postponement for gas payments. And um, obviously, this is something that's helping Erdogan to uh, look like a popular leader who cares about his population. But again, there's obviously there's there might be a price to pay for that. Turkey has been serving as an important in between. Uh, between Russia and uh, other countries, a lot of sanctioned goods, goods that would be considered gray imports, not necessarily banned, but sort of in the gray area, have been all passing through uh, Istanbul, Turkish ports, and Turkey in general. Um, so, and obviously, Turkey has been under pressure for some time to try and curb that. One notable thing that we saw since Erdogan's re election on Sunday is he had a call with US President. Joe Biden and they talked about two things which are in which Turkey is quite heavily involved in. First off, Turkey does want more modern weaponry. It has been asking the United States to sell them F-16 fighter jets and Turkey is also involved in negotiations for allowing Sweden to become a NATO member. Turkey has been dragging its feet on approving the application citing, as they describe it, terrorists living in Sweden pushing for Sweden to get them extradited. So at this moment it looks like the supply of F-16 warplanes, which are the same warplanes that Ukraine would like, are contingent on Uh, Turkey's approval for Sweden to join NATO. As we have seen in the past 15 months, Turkey has stayed away from providing weapons to the Ukraine, even though it's a member NATO, it's a member, it's a NATO member country. Turkey has offered, you know, moral support, diplomatic support to Ukraine, but it has stopped short of joining sanctions on Russia as well. Erdogan has been re-elected, that's true, but also his uh, victory has been described as a Pyrrhic victory here in Turkey by some, which also means that if Erdogan is pressed for money, which he is already, he could be looking for creative ways to shore up his budget. It could be borrowing money from the Gulf countries, which has he, which he has done. It could be asking Russia for discounts or payment deferrals, like they have been asking for gas. Or it could be asking for more, um, for some sort of loans from the United States and elsewhere. That could probably push Turkey to take a harsher stance on sanctions on Russia and maybe potentially uh, lean in more on the war effort in Ukraine. But right now we're not seeing a major policy change in the works. 
But Turkey is in a quite precarious position. Just uh, this afternoon, the Turkish national currency has dropped to a historic to a historic low. So we could be seeing a um, a tangible change in in Turkish policy on Ukraine in in the coming month as the economy gets worse. Well, thank you very much, Natalia, for that update. Well, Joe Barnes, why didn't you go first? Is there anything you're looking at over the next few days? What can you tell us about where your focus will be for the rest of your uh, reporting trip on the ground in Ukraine? So I I, I kind of uh, tease what we've been doing here for the last few days. We've been, um, and for those who listened last time I was on with Dan Ridley and TDI, Tribe Defence Initiative, we've been at their training camp in Kharkiv, on the outskirts of Kharkiv, and we've been watching soldiers of the Ukrainian army, some freshly back from Bakhmut, others have been serving on the front lines in Kharkiv, where Kharkiv borders Russia. Um, and we've been the seeing the seeing them having a, a a a break from fighting but not from being a soldier we've seen we've been witnessing them train as combat medics which we said was so vitally needed as to improve their infantry skills and bring their infantry skills and tactical work up to nato standard then this uh, this morning we've been at uh, their drone academy looking at how ukrainian drone operators are honing and mastering their skills in terms of reconnaissance and surveillance and intelligence and basically what is being done in the country to prepare for this kind of looming counteroffensive that we've heard so much about and is on the horizon. So I'd say I'd, I'd watch out for that. It's going to be a, a great piece. We've spoken to a number of um, of the traders, a number of the soldiers um, and people involved about what morale's like, what they expect to happen in the counteroffensive and what their kind of their plans are for that. So yeah, stay tuned and that should hopefully not be out in the too far future. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, do stay safe when you're out there. And we look forward to more pictures of your reporting in Ukraine and, of course, Kiev when you head back. Natalia Vasileva, would you like the very final thoughts for today? Sure. Again, I would very much watch out for Russian reaction to the suspected drone attack on Moscow. Obviously, it's not about what happened. There's nothing striking about the fact that a country that has been waging a brutal war on its neighbor for 15 months is um, getting the taste of its own medicine, although at a very large, a very low scale of that. But it would be very interesting to see if the public reaction somehow change, changes, because Russians have been very apathetic about what's happening, trying to push the war from their own worldview. So I would be very much interested to see if those drone attacks could change anything. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles. A quick note from me, a huge thank you to the Telegraph social team for their dedicated hard work over the past year and a half producing the podcasts on Twitter. What started as an instant reaction to the news of Russia's full-scale invasion, which we broadcast on Twitter live, has become the podcast you're listening to today. Thanks to the Telegraph social team for going above and beyond over the past year and a half.